Hello, everyone. Welcome to the call. I'm so excited to see a lot of friends, some old friends, some new friends, and uh, it's going to be a really great evening. So thank you for coming live, first of all. This is going to be put up on YouTube after we get done, uh, so other people who missed it can go in and watch, but uh, thank you for coming and supporting me with your energy here tonight. I appreciate that so much. So I want to just start off with just a little background about myself, um, which I know a lot of you might know, but there may be some people who don't. And that is, um, <clears throat> my name is Lana McCara, but for more than 20 years, I wrote under the name Rosie Dow. And so if you go to Amazon, you'll see me under Rosie Dow, R-O-S-E-Y-D-O-W. And I have book number 42 coming out this year. And uh, my book sales are now at a million copies. I won a national award for my fiction in 2001 with Reaping the Whirlwind. And uh, the company that published Reaping the Whirlwind went out of business. And I just found a company to bring it back. Morgan James Publishing is releasing that this year. I'm so excited to have it back. <laughs> and uh, they've been so great. And the book is, uh, the book is gorgeous. I just got my office. Rick. Here we go. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? Um, so in my... Rick. Hold on here. Um, Alice, can you mute, mute yourself, please? Let me see if I can. Oh, yeah, there we go. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so what inspired me to bring us all together tonight is this past fall, I was thinking about my new book coming out. I have two coming out this year. I have another one called Shaken But Not Stirred, which is, I'll, I'll be talking about that a little bit later, uh, which is also my work because I've been ghostwriting for the last six, eight years, and I haven't been writing my own stuff for a while. So that's why I'm all pumped. And you're seeing me everywhere because I'm like out there. <laughs> I'm doing it again. You know, I'm so excited. So, um, hey, Gina, thank you for coming. So, um, yeah. So last fall, I got to thinking about the course that we're going to be talking about tonight, and I'm giving you like a preview of it tonight, because back in the day when I won the award, I was bombarded with writers wanting me to help them write a novel because I just won a national award, and I you know, I couldn't handle it. It was overwhelming me. And I thought, well, yeah, I'm a teacher. I'm just going to make a, make, you know, make a course. I'll create a class and teach it. And that's what I did. But when I got a divorce, it closed down. I shut everything down. I couldn't do anything. I, I had to get my head on straight. And so um, it's been a while. It's been since 2010, I believe, that it's been shut down. And um, I've been wanting to bring it back, wanting to bring it back. And last fall, you know, God just said, it's time. And so I uh, modernized it to the, you know, present day and I, I brought it back. So that's why we're here. I wanted to talk about impact driven fiction. A lot of people talk about writing fiction, but tonight we're going to be talking about impact driven fiction. And what that means is that it makes a difference in someone's life. If you think about the Celestine prophecy, or you think about The Matrix. Now, I know that was a movie, but that still changed our perspective on everything. And that was fiction. So when we have this thing in our heart here where we want to write something that makes a difference, there is a technique to it. And I'm going to give you that entire lesson tonight. I'm not gonna hold anything back. And then we're gonna have questions at the end if you want, you know, a little bit more about it, because I was not a natural. I was an education major, an English minor, but I hated writing. I did not like those papers they made us write in school. <laughs> I would dread them. I did good in them, but I didn't like them. And if you would have told me when I graduated from college that I would one day be a best-selling, award-winning author, I would have been, you know, like, you're dreaming. But when I got married right out of school, I started having baby after baby after baby. 
I had seven children in 12 years. And so, you know, baby number one, baby number two, baby number three. And I was pregnant with baby number three. And my mother-in-law brought me this big stack of women's magazines. I have no idea why. <laughs> I didn't really care about women's magazines. I guess I might have liked the recipes. I don't know. But I just was sitting there and I opened one up and there was this little advertisement that said, you can write children's books. They were everywhere back in those days. This was in the 80s. And so um, that intrigued me. And then I picked up another one. You can write children's books. I mean, wow. So I thought, well, I've got children, that's for sure. You know, maybe I could um, because I was really bored. I was doing nothing but changing diapers and doing laundry and all those things. And I had no mental stimulation whatsoever. And I'm very active, you know, mentally. So I filled out the little, little coupon and sent it in and they sent me a test. And when I filled out the test and sent it back, they said, you definitely have an aptitude for this. They had asked me to tell a story about a personal event that happened to me or something like that. And, and uh, the cost of the course was $300. So we had two toddlers, one on the way. And my, my husband was making $7,000 a year. $300. I felt like I was asking for a Cadillac. <laughs> when I, but I really wanted to take that course. And we did it. I don't know how we did it, but we did it. And so once I got into that space where I was allowed to be creative and encouraged to be creative, I loved it. I was hooked. So I finished the course. I wrote the book. And I didn't get published for 14 years. I kept struggling and trying. I would submit the book to publishers. It would come back rejected. I was rejected on that first book 19 times. And I thought that was a lot, but I, I went to a James Patterson book signing on Friday night, a couple days ago. He said his first book was rejected 31 times. <laughs> That's before Amazon. You had to raise your hand and hope somebody would say yes in those days. There was no such thing as um, being on the Amazon. If you did self-publish, you had to pay a lot of money for print books and fill up your garage. There was no print on demand either. So 14 years went by and I rewrote that book five times. And after the third time, I thought, well, I bet not as many people are writing historicals. So I'm going to take my story and make it a historical. So that involved a couple of years of, you know, research, rewriting, taking the concept, putting it into history and so forth. And on the fifth time, Barber Publishing picked it up, just picked it up. And after that, they took everything I sent them. I was a reader's favorite that year. I was writing two and three books a year for them. And then uh, four years later, I won a national award. So the 14 years, and this is something I really want to emphasize for you. I was teaching myself how to write for one thing. And that was key because I did take two courses. I was re ri uh, reading writer's books, you know, constantly. But the other piece of it was my own personal development. At the time, during that space of time, I was so locked down emotionally because I was extremely abused as a child. I was very self-protective. My heart was closed down. And at the age of 37, I had a major event in my life that broke open my heart. And after I came through that crisis, I started selling books. And it's because I unlocked my heart. And it was very painful for me. But I wasn't able to express myself. I wasn't able to express character emotion. I wasn't expressing <laughs> personally. And so this is something that we're going to go into deeper and deeper tonight is that your personal development moments are key to creating a, a fiction novel that transforms lives. You tap into your own human experience. And from that, you, you pluck out the gold and then drop it into a story. 
I'm not talking about a memoir. I'm talking about people that you make up. They're nothing like the original people in the original situation, but the key elements are the same. So for my book, um, Shaken But Not Stirred, that's coming out this year, it's about a stalker. This woman has a stalker and she doesn't know who it is, but somebody just keeps on harassing her and vandalizing stuff and eventually gets into personal, you know, coming after her personally. And she doesn't know who it is. And she's like, well, if they don't tell me who they are, how can I fix it? You know, it just doesn't make sense. Um, but that's based on my own experience with a stalker. I had a stalker in 2014 and he made my life a living misery for two years and ended up with all the police action, you know, and what the police did, what they didn't do primarily, <laughs> what happened after that. And so I was so traumatized by that situation that I couldn't write it for seven years. But once I came through, I was able to take the, the nuggets out of that situation, drop them into a fiction story. In my fiction book, the woman doesn't know who her stalker is. I knew who mine was. It was somebody I broke up with. <laughs> he went psycho after I broke up with him. And so, you know, there was totally different situation there and the motivations were different. And everybody in the character was different. I didn't pattern anyone after him, me, or anything else. So that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about trying to hide your past, you know, in a novel. I'm talking about taking the elements, the key emotionally driven elements, and we're going to talk about the criteria, and dropping them into fictionalized characters new setting, new situations, and so forth. It's very powerful. It's extremely powerful. So to start off with, let's talk about the criteria for selecting these events in your life. I have four criteria. I call these before and after moments. They're the points where you know life is never going to be the same. If you sit in a doctor's office and you get a diagnosis, you know when I leave here, things are going to change. Either you're going to go into treatment or you're going to go do something else, but you're not going to keep going down the same road. My sister had cancer last year, and you know, being with her not physically with her all the time, sometimes, but just watching what happened, it's not just about the health part, it's family pain, schedules, money. There's so many facets to these different scenarios that happen. This is a whole person with a whole life. And so how do you pick out those particular moments? Well, first of all, it has to be something universal that everybody understands. For Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, and there are some reasons why these stories are timeless, because they tap into universal concepts. She wasn't at home. She was living with her family. Her parents weren't there. And she wanted to have a home of her own. And then she realized that where she was was home. And that's the same kind of situation that happened with George uh, in It's a Wonderful Life. You know, he wanted to be somewhere else. And then he realized that home was really the best place for him. Now, that's universal. That's a universal concept. When somebody says the word stalker, we all know what that means. That is an emotionally driven word. And so these universal things that happen to all of us and also relatable I mean, if an astronaut goes through a personal crisis of some type, we might not relate to that. We can't really understand <laughs> what they were going through. We might have a little idea, right? But it's not the same as losing a child or going through a painful divorce or, you know, something like that. Betrayal, abandonment, these other things. Next, uh, the other thing, it has to be very emotional. Peak emotional 
moments and events. Peak emotional moments and events. You have some stake in the game. You have this emotional roller coaster that you have gone on through this process. So we have universal, relatable, emotional, and then the last one is life changing. Life changing. Life will never be the same. I felt that way. I can distinctly remember feeling that way when we left the house to go to the hospital to have baby number four. Because this child was coming into the world. And when I came back, our life was not going to be the same. It was a wonderful thing. It wasn't a bad thing. <laughs> but yet those moments, the car accident, or those kind of things. So life will never be the same. It's life-changing. So when you have one of those moments, and sometimes these can be very um, hard to write. It takes courage to go in sometimes. Now, you don't have to, you know, traumatize people with these things. That's not what this is about. This is about holding them in the story because it is pertinent and it touches them. So I, I've read some, re, uh, some writers who want to, you know, send their reader into some spiral, downward spiral kind of a thing. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about going through this process. And so what you do is you create a character that has certain things in their life. For me, in my stalker story, for me personally in the stalker story, I had a history of being in a house with domestic violence. So my, my personal flaw or personal challenge was that I had PTSD around violence. I knew what violence was, I'd seen it. And as soon as all this happened, all of those emotions came back and I was again, a traumatized child in an unsafe home. So if you create your character with this kind of a background that is going to put them in certain spaces during this, this ride you're taking them on, this journey, you set them up, you take them through the journey, and you bring them out the other side, more mature, more wise, stronger, and ready to go on to the next phase of their life, more balanced with hope. That is the, the character arc for this type of story. It is not formulaic. It's not a formula, but it is structured. So your story are, you have your character arc where you're developing this person, you set them up, you, you bring them through certain smaller situations until they get to the big situation. And then you bring them through some other situations where uh, let's try solution A, solution B, solution C, and they're looking for answers. And as they do this exploration, you're leading the reader through that too. And then they come to the resolution and the resolution isn't necessarily fixing everything. There are some things you can't fix. People die. You're not going to fix that but you're gonna to come to peace with it. You're going to come to new normal. You're going to continue to honor their memory, but your life continues. And so when I say resolution, I mean, how does this person come to grips now with their life as it is now? So they can go forward in a stronger, better, uh, healthier way. So you have your character arc, and interweaving it with the plot, the story arc, because the situations are the story, right? The situations are the plot that you're bringing the character through and they're winding their way through. And so what I did, because this is complex, you can see, I'm trying to explain it simply. I always say that writing a novel is like juggling six balls in the air at the same time. <laughs> One of the things I would do is I would use find and replace to 
find all the times a certain person appeared. And then I would look at what they were wearing. I would watch their mannerisms. I would check their words, you know, their speech patterns and make sure they were consistent. Then I go back to the beginning with person number two, person number three. And I did that with settings and everything in my stories at the beginning when I was learning. Now I don't have to do that as much, but there is processes that you can use to make it easier for yourself. And one of the things I did was make all these charts. I made charts and worksheets and questionnaires. I have at least six, uh, six pages of charts and questionnaires on characters. So by the time you fill out all that paperwork, you know the person pretty well. Now they're gonna have to interact in the story a little bit for you to fully know them, but you've got a pretty good handle on them. And then when you get to chapter eight, and you're thinking, wait a minute, was he, is his shirt red checked or black and white checked? And then you can go back and see with all this information, just go down, bing, there it is, and I'm ready to roll on instead of having to go searching and trying to figure out, you know, what, you, what you've done. There's also um, plot, a plot chart with a column for each chapter, and then each chapter has three boxes under it so that you can write down just a few words of what's in the scenes so that you can look and say, oh yeah, they went to this place in chapter two. So now in chapter 10, I'm gonna have them do whatever. And you have your plot right there in front of you on one page or two pages, depending on how long your story is. So these helps are something that I developed because I hate backtracking. I hate looking up information. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not good with that. <laughs> so once I got to book number two, book number three, I was realizing I was doing a lot of repetitive tasks. And so I, I created these things to stop the repetition and um, to, you know, uh, get it, get it corralled, get it, get it uh, under control. So the character arc and the um, and the plot line need to be in synchronization and rolling. One of the uh, other things I wanted to emphasize too is that this is a personal event or a personal situation. We all agree we want to heal the earth, we want to eat clean food, and all of that, but that's out here. That's external conflict. And if you want to have your character fight in the fight, that's perfectly fine. But they have to have a heartfelt conflict going on inside them at the same time. They have to have an internal conflict, an internal struggle. And that's what we're talking about here. That universal, relatable, um, emotional, and life-changing that's what's going on inside of them because the inside action is where we connect to the character. The outside action is simply a structure for the character to experience the world. And those things he experiences out there in the world are going to stir up all the stuff in here. Isn't that what we do every day? The stuff in the world stirs up the stuff in here. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Fiction is actually a mirror of life. And the more we can really dig into that, the closer we will be to our readers to deliver something that will be effective, not only to to uh, make a change, but also to keep them enthralled in the book so they can't put it down. That is the thing. If you, if you make a meal with all the best techniques from culinary school and you're doing everything exactly right, you're holding your implements and you're stirring it certain ways and you've got your thermometers out, when you're finished with that dish, there's only one thing the people eating it want to know. Does it taste good? They don't care about all the other stuff. 
And so when our reader is engaging with the story, they only want to know one thing. Is this holding my attention? Is it, does it matter to me? Do I want to know what happens? That's called narrative drive. Do I want to know what happens next? And so what we're doing is we are spinning a good story embedded with the meaning. The reader doesn't really know what the meaning is until they get to that moment, which I call the boom moment. It's like, boom, <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> and something just goes bing, and then they get it. But up until then, they're just, it's just entertainment. They just like to read, and they're engaged with the characters. They like the storyline. You've set it up so that uh, it is something that interests them, holds their attention. And there are, there are ways to do that, but what I want to emphasize is that you don't want to come off hokey or cheesy. I see that so often with new writers. They have this strong, powerful message, and yes, it is. It's a strong, powerful message, but the characters are talking about it. You've got this long dialogue. Well, Joe, how did you get over your son being killed in the accident? Well, Sally, you know, I did this and I did that. Do people really talk like that? No, <laughs> no, they don't. So instead of pasting it on with di long dialogue like that or long stretches of text, you know, that's kind of lecturing the reader, instead of doing that, take the idea, create characters that those situations matter to, part of their internal struggle, because it's personal, right? And then you, you embed it deep into the story, deep into the character development. It's not pasted on, it's intrinsic. It's intrinsic to the telling of the story. You can't get around it. It's going to happen. And the way to bring that forward through the heartfelt moments, through the revelation of the person, both to the reader and to themselves, because the characters are finding out who they are too throughout this whole thing. And so that is how to create a novel that people want to read. Think of Nicholas Sparks, The Notebook. Universal, emotional, relatable, all of it, all of it. Those people were so real that you can't imagine them not, not being real. They were real. And so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about taking your story to that level and then elevating the writing quality to a professional level that would be along the line of James Patterson or Nicholas Sparks. And one of the things too that I wanted to emphasize is you don't have to be good at, at English. You don't have to be a good speller. None of that. Forget about English class right now. Because one of the biggest aha moments in my life was the first draft doesn't have to be brilliant. It just has to exist <laughs> until you get it on paper. <laughs> you can't fix it. <laughs> so you just pound it out, let it happen. And then you go back and you look at what you've got and you look at the structure, you look at all these things. And then you can go through the next time around and bring things to, to quality, to quality. And then at the end, you hire an editor to fix the grammar, punctuation, and all those tedious things. That's what they're there for. Most editors aren't writers because they don't do what we do and we don't do what they do. It's very seldom you find someone who both edits and writes. But it's everybody does it. I am an English teacher. I'm also an editor and I hire editors for my own work. The reason is once you look at that paper for so long, you are not going to see the details. 
You're never going to see that missing comma. You're never going to see that quotation mark at the end that, it, that disappeared. <laughs> you're not going to see those things. You need fresh eyes. So, you know, don't take yourself too seriously. Don't be too hard on yourself. Let your creativity flow. Take your idea, boil it down, find a characters that will act out those situations for you. Give them an antagonist, give them a villain. The person who is going counter to the hero is not necessarily a bad person. Sometimes it could just be somebody with a different agenda. And they both have a valid point, but they're going cross purposes. That's possible. Or in my case of uh, shaken but not stirred, he was a villain. He wanted to hurt her. So that is, you know, up to you. You can do it any way you want. I've done it many ways. And this applies to science fiction, romance, mystery, historicals. It applies to everything. Children's books for little kids, bigger kids. People have been asking me about writing children's books. And uh, the answer for me, I started out taking that course on children's books. And I found out it wasn't something that I felt I could roll one out after the other, like I do the novels. And the other piece is I love mysteries. I grew up reading mysteries. I love mysteries. I write mysteries. That's what I dedicated my life to learning. For children's books, the, the children and young readers are so honest. <laughs> you are not going to snow them. You have to be writing stellar material to keep their interest and cut to the chase and not too much, you know, talking and texting or text, you know, texting, uh, text, too much text. Um, get in there, get the story done and, you know, keep moving uh, because they're not going to most of them, you know, won't stick with you. Now, there are some exceptions, Harry Potter being one of them. Those middle range kids were eating up Harry Potter and I never saw the light. Those books are so huge for that age group, but they, they loved them. One writer that I could suggest to you is uh, Sarah Plain and Tall. I can't remember the name of the author. I think it's Patricia, but Sarah Plain and Tall is the book. It's a children's book. It's, it's written for like fourth grade. Don't, don't look down on it because of that. That book is amazing. I would suggest you buy that book, read it over and over again, because she can say in one sentence, an entire chapter's worth of material. Unbelievable writing. Sarah Plain and Tall. She was a big influence on me. There's been some other uh, writing people who write books about writing who have also been a big influence on me because the less words you use, the more powerful your book. So learning how to cut to the chase. So just an example with setting. Setting is very important as well. It's not just the backdrop. It, it is an integral part of the, of the story as well. If you, if you take the sentence, I turned and the, and the uh, tail of my coat knocked over the ceramic uh, shepherdess on the hutch. That's an action that happened, but it has everything to do with setting. You know a lot about the room. You know an older person lives there probably a woman. The place is probably a little cluttered and she loves her pretty little things. And you can just imagine what the rest of the room looks like. How many people have a hutch with a Chaya Shepherdess on it these days? <laughs> Not very many. So you get an idea of who the person is. And so that's what I'm talking about. Details, pulling up details that will elevate your, your writing quality without having to use a lot of words. Okay, I think that is, um, that's it for that. And wow, we're only at 435. So let's go over, I wanna show you the course just quickly. I'm not gonna belabor this. 
but I want to show you the uh, the modules in it. Let me see if I can find it here. Can you see that? Are you able to see uh, the, the page? You see my face, my picture? Yes? No? Only part of it. Um, you see my face and my name, part of my name there? Okay, I'm gonna scroll down. Okay, here we go, here's the lessons. Can you see that? Yeah, mm -hmm. I see it. Okay, okay. Module one is about getting started, organizing the book project, where to get your ideas, and how to identify your most powerful message. Now we talked about that just now. I'll be going through it again. These are lessons. I'll be giving notes and I'm gonna teach the class. I'm an English teacher and I could not just make some videos and throw them up there. I have to teach. <laughs> so I will be with you live just like now. Module two, by the, uh, the strong structure, embedding your message. We talked about that just now. How to find your, your setting and your genre. How to choose your characters. We talk about real uh, characters and made up characters in chapter in module three. The difference between real people and made up people. Sometimes you might want to have a real person in your book, but there's a way to do it. The character roles, how to develop and nurture your central characters. And then module four, back to character again, character development, the character arc, multi-layered characters, point of view. Point of view will separate you from a beginner to a professional. Very, very important if you want to sell to traditional publishers. Dialogue is another good uh, piece of it. Setting, uh, exotic or home, historical, contemporary, and how to use the setting to bring your message forward. Then module six, plot. We go through the hero's journey, the three-act structure, uh, and I have a sheet called A Paradigm for Plotting, and I will teach how to use that sheet. And you're going to get all the worksheets that I use when I create a book. You're getting my entire method in the course. The Paradigm for Plotting is one of the first things I, I fill out when I'm setting up for a new book. Then Module 7, Gripping Beginnings and Memorable Endings. Uh, and this is bringing, elevating your work, Why You Should Kill Your Darlings. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it has to happen sometimes. Grace notes and then how to decide whether you can be your own editor or not. And then tips for polishing your prose, cut to the chase, how to impress an acquisitions editor. And the ending and getting the book done is just the beginning. So that's, uh, that's what's in the course. It's going to start on February the 5th. And this first time out of the gate, it's 50% off. I just want to get some people in there. I want to run the, the program with some people and I'm anxious to get started. So I cut the price. I'm going to maybe run it again in the fall or next year, next spring. And um, it's not going to be 50% off uh, at that point. I, I guarantee that. So, okay, let's go to questions. Um, I'm just looking. Okay. Yes, Roxanne. Hi. Could you talk more about the, you just said something about point of view was very important. Could yes. You just talk a little bit more about that. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. what, whenever you launch into a scene, you're telling the scene from someone's eyes, from someone's point of view. And that should be consistent one person's point of view. You might skip to somebody else, but you have to do it in a very distinct way. You can't just hop around the room and tell what everybody's thinking. That is not good style. Um, there are some ways to, to do that, but point of view goes deeper than just telling what the person is thinking. You're also telling what they're seeing. Everything they see in the, in the room, in the setting, is from their perspective. If your point of view character doesn't have any idea what a motherboard on a computer is, then when that person sees the computer, 
the motherboard might be hanging out, but they're not going to say, oh, there's the motherboard, or you're not even going to tell it in the text. You're only going to tell what the point of view character knows and understands and their mood. So if your point of view character is a scary William, like me, <laughs> when there's some dude with a black hoodie over his head hanging out there on the sidewalk, you know, that person is going to look at that character standing out on the sidewalk and have some thoughts about they're hunched over. They're not, you know, they're not this. They're doing that. Oh, they're coming this way. Those kind of things. And they're going to describe the person in a scary way. Whereas a policeman who sees the same dude, you know, he's like, I'm going to get over there and kick his, you know what? I'm going to get him out of here. He's, he's bothering people. So it's a totally different thing, right? If you are a, a forensic professional that, you know, is with the law enforcement, you're going to go into a crime scene and you're going to go tick, 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 you're going to see everything. But if you are the homeowner who just came in after uh, somebody broke in, you're not going to go through the room like a forensic person. You're going to go through it like, oh my God, they broke my pictures. That's a whole different kind of a, a thing. So point of view is huge because it flavors everything that happens, every single thing that happens in the story, in that section that's their section. I write from single point of view most of the time. I start with one person, stick with them through the entire. Sometimes it takes some finagling to get everything in because if that person wasn't there, how do they know what happened? <laughs> well, somebody could tell them or they could find out by a video. You know, there's ways to get around it. But um, yeah, single point of view is the, is the most common way and people understand it. And that's really important. The reader understands it. Very good question. <laughs> Anyone else? So when we um, we're taking the class, we will be working on our project. Oh, thank you, Gina. Thank you for that question. Okay. The, the, the class is eight modules. Okay. And it meets every Sunday afternoon for eight weeks. Um, but you can't write a novel in eight weeks. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to inundate you with all the material. You'll have all the recordings, all the worksheets. You'll have everything you need in that eight week period. And then we are, we have a Facebook group. And so as you're working through on your novel and you get to something in one of the modules, as you're working, you could come over to the Facebook group and ask, uh, and put the question into the group. I'm going to be over there. Uh, watching, you know, the activities pretty much every day when I do my Facebook trolling um, to help, you know, in the future as you're working. So once you're, once you are enrolled in the course, you're going to be in the group. There's no time limit on that. And then future people who take it will also go into the group okay. because um, basically I'm arming you. I'm arming you with a lot of tools and resources and teaching. So then when you're deep into it, one of the things about writing a novel is I have to immerse myself. I could not take a course and write it at the same time. I'm in learning mode. I need to be in writing mode when I'm actually doing the book. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sure. Anyone else? Roxanne. Sorry, I don't know if anyone else has a question. Um, you know, one thing when I was writing my novel that I struggled with was past and present tense. Because sometimes you're writing about in the past. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. So in, in your opinion, what's a good way to really get a hold on that past and present tense? Like, is there courses or? Well, I mean, luckily, you know, I figured it out, but sometimes I still struggle with it. Sure, sure. That's a really good question because a lot of people do struggle with that. It's not, it's not an easy question. Um, most of the time, my sister wrote a book in the present tense and the publisher made her go through and change everything to the past. So there is, generally speaking, past. It's past. That's what you want. But if you are 
uh, talking about if the person is relaying or telling about something that is happening to them right there in the moment, they could be talking in the present or, you know, the, bringing the present in because of the action, but you're always using past tense. You're always using past tense. He went to the door. He picked up the lamp. That's all past tense. Mm. Yeah. Eventually it disappears. The reader doesn't even realize what, what that is. It's consistency is really, if you're, if you're not consistent, that's when they wake up. Um, you know, I'm a hypnotist as well. That's one of the things I do. <laughs> I, um, I work with people in kind of a, you know, helping healing mode for, for hypnosis. I'm not a stage hypnotist or anything like that, but writing it, or I'm sorry, reading is a hypnotic exercise, just like movies are hypnotic. That's the reason I say that is because you can sit in a movie and forget time. You're in the movie, you know, it gets over and you look up and go, oh yeah, time to get dinner. You, you don't even realize time has passed. And the same thing with reading a book, you know, you could be reading for hours, next thing you know, it's four in the morning. So what we want to do is, as writers, we want to take them into that space and not wake them up. This is one of the biggest points that I, I when I work with people in book coaching or, or whatever, is to say, don't wake them up. You know, if you use that 50 cent word and they don't know what it means, you're waking them up. If you go off the rails with a, you know, uh, uh, the tense, you know, and suddenly start moving into a different tense or, or some of these discrepancies and, and discrepancies in, you know, something that you said before, now you're saying it, you know, opposite now. Those kind of things, they wake the reader up. So you want to keep them in the reading space. And to do that, I try to write on the fourth grade level. I try my best. Every once in a while, I can't because the concept is too big or too complicated. But mostly, I try to write on the fourth grade level. There used to be a flesh reading scale on the word processor he used. I, I don't think it's on Word. But I would put my manuscripts through there and would come out with a reading level. What grade level? And I tried my best to keep it fourth grade. Now, what that means is your sentences are short. Your words are short. You're not using long words. You're using simple sentence structures. Subject, verb, object. Uh, you want to keep it as simple as you possibly can. It is difficult to write simple. We complicate things. You want to have some sentences a little longer, some sentences a little shorter, you know, mix it up. But for the most part, you're very direct in your writing. That keeps people in the trance. It keeps them hypnotized. <laughs> Isn't that what we're after? We want to immerse them in the story, give them this experience, and then boom, give them the point of growth, the lesson, the whatever you're trying to get across, helping them, and then bring them out of it with this feeling of, oh, that was awesome. Where's the next one? That's nice. <laughs> I love fiction. I believe in fiction. In my experience, fiction writers have not received enough accolades and respect uh, because nonfiction writers are the ones on stage and, you know, being called out here and there and everywhere. But we touch people at the deepest parts of their being. It's a responsibility. It's a privilege. And we have an opportunity to, to help people in a very deep and meaningful way. And I take that very seriously. And I teach that to my students as well. One of the ways to get people to uh, be hooked in to buy your book and to sell more copies is to attach it to something that interests them, the external conflict. So my stalker story, I'm connecting with uh, organizations that help people who have been stalked. There are stalker organizations out there. 
I've been uh, getting on podcasts talking about domestic violence because that is a hook. That's what they mean by a hook. Um, with James Patterson, he said that the reason that he got into writing mid-level books for kids was uh, he loved sports. He wanted to write a sports book for kids and the sports was the hook because they're going to pick that up. So for him, it was literacy, getting the kids to read, just period, just get them to read. And so using these external conflicts to connect into something that people relate to or a location or as something else, it's a lot of different ways to do that. I have a ghost in my book, so I, I've labeled it as a paranormal mystery. You know, those are hooks to get people to buy it. And then you keep them buying with this impact-driven element. I have a follow-up question on the point of view. Mm -hmm. um, Every book I've ever written has been in third person point of view, but everything I have read lately is in first person. Is there a popular switch? Do I need to start doing first person or what's the best approach? That's a really good question. It's really the, the author style. It's what you prefer. Um, both are acceptable, but here's, here's a secret. Third person is really first person in disguise. Because third person, you're in their point of view. You're only telling what they see, what they know, what they experience. You're still in their point of view. So do what makes you feel more comfortable, you know? Just, just do that because you're still writing from one person, regardless of whether you use I or he, she, or whatever. Um, there is something called, there, there is an element of point of view, which is getting a little deeper into it, which is distance. Your point of view has a distance. If you are using a, di a more far distance with it, using third person, saying he and so forth, but you don't get as close into their emotional thing, you're more kind of outside of them. You're still describing them. You're using their point of view but you're not quite as deep into it. If you're using a close third person, you are in their head. So a distant third person would be, she walked down the sidewalk and saw a shadow behind the bushes. Okay, that's, that's a more distant type. A close third person would be, she walked down the sidewalk. Oh no, is someone behind that bush? It looked like something moved. You're in her head. That's very close to first person, but you're just using she instead of I. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there anything else? This has been awesome. Yeah, um, I have... Um... So I have a painting that I'm going to do my landscape. So some some this idea came to me a, a month ago. Um, and so I have this painting and I have some characters that I saw, but I don't know um, what they're going to be doing. All I know is I'm, it's like um, the enchanted forest I'm going to do or, and the princess is like a shapeshifter. So right now, that's like all I know <laughs> what I'm doing. So I guess, <clears throat> I'll, as a, I don't know, I'll, I'll just see where it takes me, but I'm, I'm going to, I've been afraid to, like, here's my question. I've been afraid to start because if I start the painting, um, which I'm going to, and then you're, you're, this, this situation came up with you, Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yes, I'm scared because there's so many details. Um, and even like the last few days, I'm thinking there's so many details to each person because I've been thinking since I got your email, um, this could take a really long time. How much time am I going to need like 
my whole life, you know, was like, I'm, I'm just thinking, I go see my grandkids, I go do this, like, how much time should I block off for writing? Okay, okay, well, uh, knowing you as I do, and, and love you so much, Gina, yeah. uh, you will wake up one night, like, with a dream, and all of a sudden, you'll know what this, what they're doing out there. <laughs> It'll come to you, it will absolutely come to you. Just be sure that you write it down real quick before you, you know, you lose it. But okay, when I was writing during that 15-year period, I was homeschooling seven children. How? <laughs> I, was, I was not writing every day. Okay. I was writing in two-hour increments when I could catch some time. And I started out, eventually, I got to where I was getting up early to write before they woke up. I would write from five to seven in the morning. But, you know, I'm driven for it. I, I have a passion for writing. I have to do it. It's, if I'm not writing, I feel deprived and I feel, you know, dry and I, I need it. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to say that, um, Gina, you just take the time that you have and just like you get the impulse to pick up a paintbrush, you'll get the impulse to write down a little bit more of this and with the notebook with the novel notebook you can just write out some stuff stick it in there write out some more stick it in there and you know you're compiling this information so that when you have a block of time to sit down and actually get it together you've got material you've got stuff there and you can do it yeah i'm i'm gonna do it um but i might get scared sometimes so and I, and when you were just talking about you forgot what the the one character was wearing and you had to go back into your notes and she's wearing the black and red check thing and i'm thinking to myself oh my god they wear clothes too <laughs> so yeah <laughs> <Eight> dinner <laughs> <laughs> i don't know I don't know. It's, I guess it, it sounds so fun though. I really feel like it sounds really, really fun. It and, is very fun. Yeah. yeah. And learning will be fun. So I'm going to do it. So, so glad. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're at the top of the hour. Is there anyone else that has a question? I don't want to cut anybody off. I want to. I do. Is, is, is it, are these concepts also applicable to writing nonfiction? They, um, Depending on what kind of nonfiction you're wanting to write, um, if you're doing something that has case studies or stories of events that happened that explain something in the book, um, if you're doing a memoir, uh, anything like that where there's stories, every nonfiction book has some stories in it. Uh, because one of the reasons I went into ghostwriting, and most of my ghostwriting books are nonfiction, is because I was able to write the stories, you know, the case studies and all that stuff in a deeper way because I have the ability to create people and talk about situations. And also to know how to, how to realize what is the key point in the story? What is the conflict, the main conflict, the, the problem that I need to, you know, like have problem, Worst problem resolution. That's still, I mean, it's still appropriate for any story, whether it's true or not. You have to know how to tell a story. Thanks. You're welcome. I'm glad to see you here, Rick. Yeah, it's good to be here. Okay. Uh, well, if that's all, we will um, we'll say goodbye. I'm going to download the recording, and I am headed to the airport from here. So bear with me. I will get this done. <laughs> it might not be till late tonight or tomorrow, but I will um, have the re you know replay up. I'm flying to Boston, and I'm going to be speaking at Harvard on Wednesday. Woohoo! Wow, that's nice, Lana. You know, I feel like I'm dreaming. <laughs> yeah. So um, when I sign up, I'll get the printout for all the um, the notes. Yes, I will be giving out the notes module by module. So oh, okay. a couple of days before you'll get the material, then we'll have the class. And then the next week you'll get the next set and so forth. It's quite okay. a lot of stuff. Oh, great, great, great. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank